Working Cows Podcast, Episode 217. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network, here with another episode for you guys. And this episode is brought to you by the National Pork Board. Request your free on-farm sustainability report at porkcheckoff.org slash sustainability. As a pig farmer, you know that sustainability is doing what's right for people, pigs, and the planet. However, Doing what's right must be shared with today's savvy customer to help grow public trust in pig farming while protecting your freedom to operate. To measure and document your farm sustainability efforts, National Pork Board encourages you to create a free on-farm sustainability report. These reports can help increase production efficiencies and improve your bottom line. Request your free report at porkcheckoff.org slash sustainability. And if you are a Patreon supporter, I'd ask you to stick around for the end of the show. Got a special announcement uh, in the outro today, so just stick around there. If you have been a Patreon supporter or you have ever considered becoming one, I'd just ask you to stick around there. Very excited today to be joined by Pete Farrell. We're going to talk to Pete about some exciting things that they're doing on their ranch as far as succession but also just business structure uh separating the the operating business from the land business separating the management from the land and some of the opportunities that that has opened up for them and some of the ways that they are creating buy in there to encourage people to stick around for a long time and invest in the success of the business so very excited to talk with Pete Farrell today about these things so Pete Thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Play, I'm honored to be here and uh, pleased that you would ask me. The I've recently contracted with the uh, with Ranching for Profit or the Ranch Management Consultants to run their winter webinar series. And uh, back at the beginning of 2021, you were you were the first in their winter webinar series, and you shared a pretty compelling story about uh, succession at 4L Grazing and the Farrell Ranch. So I'd like to talk to you about the distinction between those two entities today. But first, I, I would like to give you the opportunity to share just a little bit of history of the Farrell Ranch and what uh, what it is, um, yeah, where, where it is in the world and, and kind of how it has operated in its history. Right. Well, um, our roots are extremely deep here. Uh, the ranch was founded by my great-grandfather in 1888. Um, he was orphaned as a consequence of the Civil War. It's kind of a classic rags to riches story where he went west with the pioneers, first telegraph operator in Council Grove, first telegraph operator in Wichita, Kansas. That was his one of his uh, money making. He was a, a, a jack of all trades. He sold apples to the settlers. He fixed watches. He began to amass a lot of money and he eventually invested that money in the ranch that I now live on. My wife and I live in the house he built in 1923. The ranch basically um, then went past from my great grandfather through a series of tragic events to my father during the Depression Dust Bowl years. Every family has tragedies, ours is no exception. There was the tragic death of um, my father's brother. There was mental instability. Um, uh, My father said they came this close to losing the place during the Depression, no money. And so I, I point that out because I consider myself a grandchild of the Depression and the Dust Bowl because those events so strongly affected both of my parents. My dad was born in 1907, my mother in 1912. So when you think about what they saw and taught me because of those events, that's that's what molded me to be 
frugal. And uh, I don't know if he ever said it, but my father clearly lived the ethic that bare ground was a sin. I mean, he just, I think he was terrified by what he saw of the Dust Bowl. So he held it together. He had an MBA. Um, he could have gotten uh, a really good job in, during the Depression with uh, an oil company, but he turned it down and he came home because the place was literally falling apart. Uh, spent his formative years doing that, married the most amazing woman, my mother, uh, during those hard years, uh, started the family and was amazingly successful. Uh, at the age of 61 or two, um, and this is where I had a front, front row seat on uh, a failed succession plan. He woke up one morning to find that the ranch that he had worked so hard on had been partitioned. And uh, it was gone. You know, it was literally gone overnight. And he was not going to inherit all of this ranch. Um, <clears throat> fast forward, I go to school, come back. I've got this lucrative degree in anthropology. <laughs> That's a joke, but it did teach me quite a bit about human nature, in fact. And I don't regret that at all. But um, I, too, was faced with his ill health in, when I came home in 74, um, I realized that if I didn't come home, it was gone and he needed help. And so I came home, pitched in. They were the most wonderful years of my life. I had uh, four and a half years working here basically as a carefree ranch hand, <laughs> $250 a month plus room and board. And, and I was in heaven. Uh, I moved into the old shack down here with no, no heat or plumbing. My college roommate was working with me. Um, we had we had the time of our lives. We were carefree cowboys, beer, beer, girlfriends. Um, I, and then one day it was suddenly over, <clears throat> you know, he died and I had never written a ranch check. Hmm. So um, that was traumatic for me. Like, Oh my. And I forgot to tell you the most important part about a year or two in, he must have been convinced that I wasn't going to leave. And he says to me, do you want to buy it back? And he's referring to half the ranch. And he goes, you want to buy it back? And I quickly said, oh, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> but, by the way, never do that without giving it a little more thought because, you know, he dies four years later and I'm looking at um, a check that I don't know how to write. I mean, I really like it. So it's it's crisis management for me from that day in 1980 till I met Stan Parsons in 1987. Now, <clears throat> I work with Kansas Farm Management. I learned about balance sheets. I, you know, I had, I had to write this check. I sold down his herd to lower the debt load, but it was significant. I had um, three quarters of a million dollars of debt against a $2 million asset. When you do the numbers there, that's a scary equity position that I lived with for a long time, trying to figure out how to make these payments. But I divested of his herd. I went into custom grazing. And then the big formative experience of my life was meeting Stan Parsons in the Ranching for Profit School. And boy, was I a sponge for what he had to teach. Because, like I said, I was winging it throughout that time. And then all of a sudden, the learning how to distinguish between economics, which is how to grow your balance sheet, and finance, which is how to write the check, was transformative for me. And I have, uh, again, I credit Stan Parsons. I credit David Pratt. And, of course, I'm so pleased to see that Dallas Mount is carrying on this I mean, I, I'd like to think I would have gotten through without that, but it was, I mean, it, it, kept, it kept me on this land, quite frankly. It's the formula through which, you know, and learning how to trust my numbers. It was an amazing experience, um, Clay. And um, again, I credit the whole thing. And then the rest of that history, I'll just, I'll close out by saying I was a founding member of Executive Link. Um, for reasons I don't understand, Stan hired me as the first EL facilitator to go out 
and work with other ranchers. I worked as an EL facilitator from 1993 to 1998. And I was always a little embarrassed to be paid to do that because can you imagine going to these ranches, listening to their issues? And I was learning so much by being part of that discussion. And I would bring all these nuggets home and use them myself. And so it was, man, it was, it was my grad school experience in ranching. And I'll be forever grateful to Stan for giving me that opportunity. You talk about the importance of separating uh, economics and finance. Um, is that related to the current structure of the business where you have uh, feral ranch and 4L grazing? Is that kind of just the, the logical outcome of those two things? In a way, we apply both of those principles to both companies, but that was a core principle that Stan stressed was separating the management of the land from the ownership of the land. And one of the reasons that I um, uh, developed 4L Grazing, it was in, in 2004, was because the bookkeeping became a lot simpler and clearer we could clearly see the effect by by not having to deal with land appreciation and the property taxes and the debt over on the land side. We could, I could so much more clearly see mm. the effect of my management of that land. <clears throat> and Stan always said, you know, include opportunity rent in your management scheme. Well, I decided... Uh, play to make that a real check. I decided I'm going to write a real check from the management company to the land company every year. This is no longer something arbitrary. And I would write that. And of course, I was also renting land from my mother at the time. She owned a portion of the ranch. And so I thought, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Mm -hmm. I'll just separate this right now. And it was also to make a statement. I didn't know the, the career trajectory of my own two um, offspring. And I, I'm being really careful here to call them my adult offspring. They're not my kids. They're not, they're not children. And Clay, that's been a key mental shift for me. And I'll talk about that in a little bit of you talk about letting go. We have to let go of our roles as parents and begin to speak to the next generation, adult to adult. And so if that's been the one thing I've been focusing on since I turned 60-ish, that's been it. How to really speak to the next generation with the respect and honor that they deserve. And boy, they, they need that kind of support, in my opinion. So um, it was to make a clear statement with 4L Grazing that you don't get to work here just because your last name is Farrell. There's a professional positions there that need to be filled by people who regard this as a bona fide business. And so that was one reason I did it. But it had benefits beyond that that I couldn't imagine at the time. And so I'll fast forward to... Um, um, as I said, I, 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 was a, I was a founding member of Executive Link. This is, <clears throat> for people who don't understand it, it sounds a little bizarre. <laughs> we pay thousands of dollars to go into a room three times a year to receive criticism from a peer group. And I got to tell you, it's one of the most powerful things that you'll ever do. But it sounds a little nutty. Yeah, you're going to pay all this money. And you're gonna, and your peer group is gonna beat up on you and ask very critical questions. So as I approached 60, I realized that I wasn't getting the job done. Like, and the thing that was suffering was this ranch. I realized there were some pretty big strategic things that weren't happening, and I wasn't the guy that was gonna be able to do them. And so I got real serious about finding my replacement in 4L grazing. And, and Clay, get this, it took me five years. It took me five years because I wasn't going to settle for somebody who couldn't do a better job than I was doing. And thankfully, I did find him. His name's John Wagner. 
I met him through Executive Link. That's where, in my opinion, the sharpest and brightest minds are are there. And um, and uh, I've worked with him now for four and a half years, and he impresses me every day to this day. You know, he is a brilliant young CEO. But the critical thing that happened, Clay, and it, you know, this took some evolution, was for me to let go of the authority and the responsibility that I had held for 40 years. And, and that's a hard job. That's a hard thing to do is to really let go. And so working with John, we rewrote the operating agreement of 4L Grazing, which is now a standalone multi-member LLC. And what we did was we designated John in legal blue ink. He is now the member manager not me. And he's also the the president of the company. And it was after we did this that I heard this amazing story, just happenstance. I was on a vacation in Missouri. I meet this guy who's been working his whole life in Hy-Vee grocery stores, which is a grocery store chain in the upper Midwest. We don't have them in Kansas, but I knew of them. And he said that company was founded so that the day you're hired on, get this, you own a piece of the company. And he said the employee turnover was somewhere between eight and 10 years because the day you begin as a sack boy, you see the financials, you own a piece of this company and it's called skin in the game. And he said he now owns, he started as a sack boy and now he owns three stores. And this guy was at a pretty we were at a nice resort. He clearly had done well for himself, but I said, that's what I want. That's what we need to do is, you know, when it's just a job, you're not going to put up with the difficulties of ranching because it's not a nine to five. And so I was totally inspired by this and working with John. Now we've structured 4L grazing to be, to become an employee owned company. And now this is my strategy for getting out. You know, I want employees to come in and earn their way into this company, both earning cash benefits, but member shares. And eventually my shares will get significantly reduced, probably to something, you know, a minority share. And eventually I will sell out and and get out. And uh, we've structured this so that 4L Grazing has a secure five-year lease with the Feral Ranch. We've got drought clauses in there. I I, under, I wear two hats. I'm working. I'm still working in the management company, but I'm the trustee of the Feral Ranch. So I understand. But the great thing that I've come to realize is that it's a good symbiotic relationship. The Feral Ranch would have a hard time finding another company to provide the the ecosystem services that foil grazing is Mm -hmm. providing. And believe me, under John's leadership, this landscape has really changed. I mean, in his short tenure Mm -hmm. here, you can see this prairie behind me. And the health of this place has improved remarkably with his improved grazing techniques. He's a master stockman. Uh, We brought in small ruminants. I don't know who ever thought that one species, cattle, could maintain the the biodiversity of of the tall grass prairie. You know, it's like, and once you see what other species can do to groom that landscape, it it is nothing short of inspiring. It's just amazing to witness the changes that he's implemented. And so, thankfully, I did let go. You know, I did let him take the reins for real. You know, he has signature privileges on all the accounts. And yeah, that's scary because, yeah, it's still my money. But the consequences of not letting go are far greater. You know, I can't imagine this business, this land perpetuating, which is what I want. Took that term from Joel Salatin. This isn't as much a succession plan as it's it's a plan for perpetuating uh, uh, an economic and ecological unit mm-hmm. that could benefit others well into the future, as it's benefited me. 
You know, I want the next generation to have the opportunity and the rewards that I've had. And this is getting around to a point that I've only recently understood. We really need to take the cost of the land out of the equation. It now seems nutty to me to expect every generation to buy this land because you know who suffers? The land will suffer and the individuals paying for it will really suffer. And I learned that you can pay rent all day. You can pay rent, but paying principal on this land, well, quite frankly, the economics of that haven't worked since the 1920s. Mm-hmm. Land has been speculated on by other sectors of economy. You know, you come in with oil or a car dealership or wherever else. Those are the people who can afford to buy land, but they didn't get that money from the land. Mm-hmm. They they got it elsewhere in the economy. Yeah, very and good. I was I was in the odd position where I didn't have other forms of income until the wind farm came along. I had to learn to write that check from what the land would produce. And I always say I inherited just enough ranch to be dangerous. <laughs> I had enough equity, you know, when I began to borrow and learn how to write the check, you know, and that was, that was, and I, I'd like to think that I could have learned that otherwise, but like Stan used to say, sometimes you can't read the writing on the wall until your back is against it. And my back was against it. I had to figure this out. Yeah. So was Stan uh, as high on custom grazing as I think um, maybe the, the the ranch management consultants has come become over the years? Was was he in favor of that business model when you came in with that already in place? You know, I can't recall. I I can't recall what his opinion of that was. You know. Um, I do. I didn't understand till years later, and Fred Provenza taught me this. I didn't understand the economic value of a residential herd. You know, I saw our homegrown calves consistently gain three pounds per head per day on grass, and all of those brought in cattle. I didn't understand it then. Fred was the one that taught me the value of nutritional wisdom and what those cows earn. So. I didn't understand what I lost when I sold dad's cow herd that had been going on here for three or four decades. You know, those cows knew this ranch. And so that's an argument for us to get back into ownership. And then the biggest argument that I would give you was, guess what happens when you get into a three-year drought? (laughs) Well, custom grazing is top line revenue and it's just gone and I had nothing to sell. I had I the the equity in four L raising just dropped like a rock. Uh I I became the sole employee. And so there is great value in owning owning livestock when you get to a drought because you need that equity to survive it in my opinion. And so it was after the drought of 2010 to 13, that we made, this is before I met John Wagner, but our strategy is now to change from a majority custom grazing to a majority of ownership. Mm -hmm. And John is um, a student of Wally Olson. John is a student of the sell by. We are learning how to capture the appreciation in young breeding animals. And quite frankly, there's a lot of money there. There is a lot of money there, a lot more than in taking a slim piece of somebody else's margin in custom grazing. And yes, there's a lot more risk there, but we're now in a, in a more stable condition. Whereas 20 years ago, I couldn't afford to take the, the, the risk of ownership. I just, I didn't have the latitude in the business to do that. Well, now our equity positions are stronger and we can afford to do that. And we are doing that. Will those cows be owned by 4L Grazing or by the Farrell Ranch? Oh, all ownership of livestock is in is in uh, is in the management company. The Farrell Ranch only owns land and life insurance, which is part of the succession plan. That's all it owns. But it also has the land debt, the property taxes, responsibility for infrastructure, new infrastructure. 
it's got the big ticket expenses over there and it can handle those. But I was reading Robert Kiyosaki 20 some years ago. And so the Feral Ranch is basically a passive income company. It gets rent from foil grazing and it gets royalty from the wind farm. So I always say, as long as the rain falls and the wind blows, I'll be okay. And sometimes the rain doesn't fall, but the wind always blows, even in a drought. And so I set it up because it's just super simple. And it doesn't, there's nobody works in, in the feral ranch except me. And I'm just an administrator over there. All of the the 10,000 moving parts occur in the management company, you know, in all the employment, all of the complex trading accounts that we have to watch. The accounting has become much more complex since we've moved into ownership, but that's okay. We're, we're, we're willing and able to handle that. And the good thing is that John now owns um, 1% of the company. Um, by the end of this year, I want him to own 10%. I want to just really accelerate the the movement of my ownership gets diluted the more employees quote unquote buy in and furthermore um, they employees with the approval of the members can also own livestock john owns 25 percent of our cow herd he owns 100 percent of the sheep herd it is in my interest for him to grow his balance sheet i want him to grow his i want everyone have the opportunity I had here to use this land to grow themselves personally and professionally. That's my goal. Can, can you talk about your quality of life um, early on and, and through even through, um, you know, just kind of the, the way you had to go about working uh, to, to make things work? <laughs> well, you have a question here about Whitby madness. And that's a great way to put it. So, we still experience that clay. We still have, and quite frankly, that's normal. You know, nature bats last. And if, if you have an industrial mind, you're probably not gonna get along here very well. Because one of the amazing things about John is, is that we look at what's in front of us every day. And as I've said throughout my career, I've never had one boring day in ranching, not one, not ever, because you have to remain nimble of mind and body because you're going to think you know what you're going to do today. And then you're going to go out there and find that she's dealt you a different hand and you've got to deal with that. And so we try and here's again, this is another wonderful thing that's come out of, of ranch management and executive length. John is now, I used to use job descriptions, huge mistake. By the way, I used to hire on skill sets. I want to deviate here just a moment. That's a terrible way to hire. And the first guy that pointed this out to me was my friend, Duke Phillips. He said, when he's hiring, he asks for a cover letter and a resume. And he says, if I don't see passion in that cover letter, we don't go any further. Because if you don't have the passion for the mission, you're not going to stick with it. So we are watching for lifelong learners who are mission driven, who really have the regenerative bug in their veins, who really want to feel the effect of their work. And we will give them that opportunity here. But I deviated in saying that John's working now to fashion what does what are the results that this business needs and to put those into effectiveness areas and position agreements where a person agrees, I will, I agree to try to achieve this result. Now we know we're not always going to accomplish that, but that makes the metric really clear. And it helps even now, it's helping me stay in my lane. For example, I'm still CFO, financial director of Foil Grazing, and I'm also head of HR. So I do, I help initiate the firing. John has final say, of course. And then I produce all the financial reports. Again, I'm, I like knowing what my position is here. It's, it's so much clearer now. Now, there are days when things just go to clay. I mean, they just do. 
and we're going to have miserable days. I mean, we had a storm here on October 10th. It was devastating. We lost a significant number of small remnants. It just, it's going to happen. The, the team, I wasn't actually here. The team was two or three days recovering from that. And so, yeah, you plan to do one thing and then another thing is going to happen. And you just, you just got to remain nimble. John has a great saying here. I'm going to quote from our apprentice um, brochure. He says, if you're not getting the results you want, you're probably getting the experience you need. And so that speaks to who we are and what we're doing right now. And um, the apprentice program has been just a huge breath of fresh air into the culture of this ranch, having young people here challenging us with great questions. Why do we do it this way? <laughs> and, um, you know, Clay, there's a, there's, there's a, a, a joke, uh, you know, there's this, this funny joke that I've told for years. What, what does every cowboy say just before he dies? And the punchline is hold my beer and watch this. So, <laughs> but there's also, Another sad thing that I've heard say, ranches on the verge of going out of business, you'll hear them say, we've always done it this way. And I love traditions, Clay. I was born into this deep traditional ranch. But what I say to those ranchers is, please remember that everything that we hold as a cherished tradition right now was once brand new. And we've got to hold on to the traditions, traditions that are still valuable and let go of those things that are not. And you asked, what's strategic thinking? And it's really backing away, like Stan said, go to the balcony, go to the 50,000 foot level and ask yourself, should we own cows? <laughs> That's a big question for some people. Should we be putting up hay? you know, really backing away and looking as objectively possible. And that's hard to do. That's where executive link is so brilliant because they're going to ask those hard questions. They're going to ask you, why are you doing that? That doesn't make sense to me. And then you got to either justify it or not. And you'll come out with a, a better path, if you will, uh, from those from those. Uh, questions yeah. from those strategic yeah. questions. Yeah, very, very good stu stuff there. My my dad is a friend. Both of them combined probably have um, nearly a hundred years in ranching experience, and uh, and he, his friend is fond of saying the the learning curve continues to be straight up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. You know, uh, and it it's painful and expensive. I've often thought, you know, I would have been better if I'd have gone away for a few years, maybe gotten an MBA and hired somebody else to run this land, ranch because, boy, I made some some bonehead mistakes in my early years, you know, and that's what you do when you don't know. You just you just do that. And, and yeah, I learned from it. If you don't get what you want, you're getting experience. And I've had a lot of experience. <laughs> <laughs> you talked earlier about getting employees to have uh, buy-in and and that's in a literal sense right in the in the way you guys it can, have it can be we don't demand it you know we are turning on that beacon saying that opportunity is here and hopefully we will attract employees that understand the value of that again if you choose to buy into foil grazing you have the security of using this land that's where I'm trying to take the cost of the land out of the equation. You can come into ranching without having to buy this land. And that's the, that's the door I'm wanting to open. Can you tell me about the ins and outs of that agreement? What does that look like for somebody to buy in literally to, to the ranch? Well, to the, to the ranch management company. Right. Yes. For well, yep. crazy. Yeah. Um, they come on as an employee working for wages, if you will, and once they choose to either put money or time, they can buy in with cash, buying the member units, or again, this is up to the members. And right now, John and I are the only members. So, and I think foil raising will always be 
in my mind, a small, closely held company. I think that's what works best. I don't envision it becoming a mega ranch at all. But um, so if you choose to take units instead of cash, that day you become an owner and you become, you become, you get a guaranteed payment. Wages are not withheld. Then you get a K-1 from the company saying, here's what the company earned that year. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a small LLC. And it's actually, if you're familiar with those structures, it's not that complicated. But it, overnight, you discontinue becoming an employee and you are literally an owner of the company or co-owner of the company. Right. And, and so you would be you would be invited into you know th- those management decision making uh, processes whatever they are if they're meetings and those kinds of things. Oh well, we do that from the get go. We actually do that even with the the apprentices. We're we're transparent. That's part of our apprentice program. Bill Milton. Uh, and by the way, I want to I want to put in a plug here: the Kavira Coalition led by Julie Sullivan, Leah Ritchie. Those people are nothing short of brilliant. They are a decade ahead of everybody else on mentor apprentice programs, and I credit them completely. But Bill Milton in one of the mentoring sessions says, they're not here to learn from your successes. They will learn more from your failures. So we're transparent, Mm -hmm. really transparent with them and in our management meetings about what hasn't worked, what, you know, where we've had problems, that's where the learning curve is best. Is yeah. And if I, you know, I don't want anybody else to make the same bonehead mistakes I did. It's expensive. And so if I can help prevent that, and at the same time, we have to give them the latitude to go out and learn on their own. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to have failures. They're, they've they they've got to learn all the hands-on stuff themselves but um and that's that's just part of it it yep. yes it increases our overheads but it's been it's been well worth it to deepen our team with with the educational aspect of having apprentices on the ranch yep i interviewed sam ryerson and sarah wenzel fisher about that apprentice program oh, yeah. and so oh, it's amazing yep and then the other thing that came to mind when you were talking is Luke Perman, who was a guest on the Working Cows podcast, uh, was a guest on a different podcast called Roots and Ruminants. And he said that ranch management is the craft beer of the ranching industry. And what he meant by that was that craft beer had this meteoric rise in popularity over the last 30 years, let's say. And ranch management is going to be that for the ranching industry, that that people are going to get paid based on their skill as a manager in the future of ranching more than they do based on their equity and land and animals. Exactly. And, and, and Clay, we don't have slack in ranching. You know, we need people to come in who are going to feel the sting of their losses and get rewarded for their gains. And that again, ranching is an exercise in reality. (laughs) I mean, you can really freeze out there. I mean, you can really get hurt. You can really take a financial crash. And you, if you're, if you're, if you're an employee, you probably won't feel that. But if you're an owner, you're going to feel that. And you, you need that direct feedback on your actions. You know, when I lose a radio, the overheads go up. Um, when I assist a cow and save a calf, I improve the gross margin. And I actually, I know this sounds silly, but I go out there and I think in balance sheets, you know, I, I literally connect my actions with what is this going to do to the balance sheet of the business? I know that sounds a little silly, but Stan drilled that into me from day one, that every action I take has both an economic and financial consequence. Every action does. And, And of course, I was the only guy for years noticing this on the balance sheet. Now I want everybody to see the balance sheet. Hmm. You mentioned earlier also about letting go. And uh, I think that something that you have kind of touched on is the importance of the the outgoing generation, if I can use that term, uh, the importance of them having something to let go to. Could you talk a little bit about that line of thinking? Right. Well, the thing I'm letting go to and the thing I want to spend the remaining 
time in, on this planet is, is mentoring the next generation. And then again, I could not have known how gratifying and inspiring that is until we actually started doing it with the, our apprentice program is just, is, is brand new. And they're staying on as second year apprentices. And one of them, it's, it's uh, Katie Roberts and uh, Ethan Young. And Katie's going to spearhead our next apprentice program. So we, I'm, the, and by the way, the Feral Ranch is funding this because in the past, I always put the profits of the Feral Ranch back in the land. Well, I finally got it through my head that I would be better off in the future to invest in people. So I am making a, a significant investment in people. And my family is going like, now, wait a minute, you're going to invest thousands of dollars in people who may not stay on the ranch? And I go, that's true. I'm going to do that. But I think that the wrenching profession needs to do that. When you look at the other professions and the money they put in to building a deep bench, well, we don't have a deep bench in agriculture, and we certainly don't have a deep bench in regenerative agriculture. Mm. So that's what I'm going to, Clay. That's where I want to spend my time and money, especially as I move out of working in the business. And then there's this, there's this famous Irish legend, and I've mentioned it before, and it's, it's a hard thing, <clears throat> especially as I watch um, fathers and sons. And they, the legend says that every son must kill his father. And believe me, some of them wish they could do it literally, but this is figurative. Every son must kill his father. And every father must let him. And that speaks to the need for everyone in my generation to literally say sincerely, this is yours now. Build your life with it. Mm. I've had my time. And if we don't let go, I mean, I've heard these incredible stories of sad stories of 70-year-old men still holding on to the reins while their 40 and 50 year old sons kind of wait to take over. And think about that, Clay. They've already passed the peak of their lives waiting to be, to be given the authority. And to me, my heart aches for that, for those brilliant young offspring who want to ranch, but were not. And a lot of them, as you know, they just leave. They just go, I'll go, and I've seen this. They they and they need to leave. They just they just leave the home place and they go figure out how to do this elsewhere, and um, that's what they have to do. But that's that's kind of a tragedy within our profession is learning how to let go. And believe me, I took a lot of coaching. Clay, we have a family coach and counselor who really drilled this into me, and it started with how do I relate to my own adult offspring. And then it really helped in me learning my relationship with John Wagner. You know, he is the authority here now. He has the, and I, it couldn't be just a title for him. That's why we, we, we altered the operating agreement. So this is, this is blue ink on a, in a legal document says he's the manager. He's the president. Oh, and here's a, a neat thing that could happen that I hope will happen. You know, John is currently the CEO of the company, but he's already told me that he'll go on in five years to some other position that, you know, he doesn't want to live his life here. But I'm hoping that the future members of the company will retain him as the president, which is a governing position outside the company because, you know, and I want him to retain some ownership even as he leaves as manager, because I want him to have a vested interest going forward in the success of this company. And he's already pr proven his, that he has the strategies to, to watch over this. So to me, that's the way to perpetuate a company is to keep people involved that have a vested interest in it. Yeah. We've talked a lot about uh, today about the 4L grazing side of this equation. Could you talk a little bit about uh, Feral Ranch, its governance, how, where's the Venn diagram of leadership and how that crosses over with 4L grazing and Feral, Ra Feral Ranch and those things? Could you talk a little bit about how that's structured? Sure. Um, my adult offspring, Jacob and Lauren, um, Jacob, they're both in their 30s. They, he, he's a licensed civil engineer. I got 
two grandkids there. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, my daughter is recently married. She's a, a practicing physician, family practice in our county seat. So they're both close. They love this place as their ancestral home. That's very clear. They grew up here. They worked here as young persons. I did not force them in any way. I made it clear this was a career choice and they chose other things. So, um, but back to the point, basically I'm now the sole trustee of Feral Ranch LLC, which is a combination of trusts that owns this land. But we are already having regular meetings with the, I'm having meetings with the two of them discussing, quote unquote, the ongoing business of the Feral Ranch. And the idea is, and I'll probably bring in, Clay, and this is brand new thinking, I'd like to bring in a paid trustee, somebody 20, 30 years younger than I, to sit with them to learn the aspects of the ranch so that when I'm gone, they'll have somebody in the ranching profession to kind of coach and guide them going forward. So if you would imagine four chairs around the table, myself, my two adult offspring, and a paid trustee discussing the ongoing business. And it's not much of a business. Like I said, it's just passive income. But what do we do with that is basically what's the mission of the Feral Ranch going forth? How shall we use that? And uh, so then my seat is empty someday and the three of them go on. That's the idea there. That's still quite formative. Again, they're busy doing what I was doing in my 30s. They're growing their families. They're growing their professions. And they're doing very well. They they don't ask anything of me. They haven't asked money of me really since they left the household and they're they're fully launched in their careers. They don't they don't behave entitled, but I'm I'm sure that they want to perpetuate this. But um, you know, it's not there's not a lot of urgency around that right now. And I guess I think we've we've covered covered the outline. Do you have anything else that you wanted to share with regard to to these things? Um any any big uh, final final takeaways? You know, I'm sure I'll think of that once we hang up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we've covered the the big ticket items here uh, without having looked at my notes. I think, um, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I really need to acknowledge that I've never done this alone, that I've consistently had amazing people in my life that have, you know, guardian angels, angels if you will, that have watched over me. And as I look back, Clay, I'm, I'm one of the luckiest guys you'll ever meet. I really am, man. I have been given a life beyond measure and I'm grateful. You know, I, I, I don't often or ever really give my guests homework, but would you be willing to send me just a, a list of formative books and they could be biographies. They could be, um, you know, business books, whatever. I, it just seems, I mean, you've talked a lot about just uh, things you've read, continuing education uh, that you've exposed yourself to. And I think more important than necessarily telling people this is what you do, uh, these are the, this is the recipe, so to speak, is this is, this is how you could shape your mind to think in a way that leads right. to these kind of conclusions. Well, I need, on that note, I need to mention, you know, obviously Stan Parsons was a, a very strong mentor in my life. And, but there are two other mentors in my life that have, that have continued the ethic of my father. One of them is Wes Jackson, who founded the Land Institute. And the other is the amazing Wendell Berry. And I have read deeply from both of them. And Wes was the one who coined the phrase, nature as measure. Look to nature as measure for what we are doing. What would nature do is another way of putting that. And that is a mantra that has guided me and has probably prevented me from going down the industrial road with this operation. I I am weary of that word industry, and I don't think it should be applied to agriculture. Mm. And so I have intentionally tried to ask, what would nature do with this amazing piece of tall grass prairie? 
And that has been a mantra that's guided me over the years. And I learned that from Wes and Wendell. I really, I read deeply about what they had to say. Hmm. Very good. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that early on in this conversation that if you have an industrial mindset, it, you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else in this industry. Or, or the land. Or right. the land. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that's you know, that's the sacred ground that that's, you see behind me. And uh, so that's what I don't want to do is hurt this land. Yep. I would love to leave it better than I found it. Yep. Well, you've had an interesting journey with regards to, and I'll call it concessionizing, um, and we'll define that term if, if you've got some time and some bonus content. But for now, uh, thank you for your time today. Clay, it's been an honor to speak with you, and I hope this has benefit to my, my, my brothers in ranching and sisters in ranching. As a pig farmer, you know that sustainability is doing what's right for people, pigs, and the planet. However, doing what's right must be shared with today's savvy customer to help grow public trust in pig farming while protecting your freedom to operate. To measure and document your farm sustainability efforts, National Pork Board encourages you to create a free on-farm sustainability report. These reports can help increase production efficiencies and improve your bottom line. Request your free report at porkcheckoff.org slash sustainability. Very good stuff there with Pete. Really appreciate his openness and willingness to share uh, that it's difficult, but definitely uh, definitely worth it and possible to find the right people, get the right people in the right seat on the bus. And uh, very, very good stuff there. Very much appreciate all of you who have signed up to support via Patreon over the past uh, few years. Uh, very much has been a blessing to my family. Many of you did that last year at a yearly rate, which is a possibility you can sign up to support for a year. And so if you uh, did that last year, a lot of you did that right around the holiday season, right at the in, in December. And a lot of those uh, signups will renew here coming up December 1st. So uh, day after tomorrow, if you're listening to this on the Monday at released, uh, just wanted to give you a heads up that those yearly renewals will be coming. And uh, you can you can join anytime you can become a member anytime uh, you can uh, sign up at any time uh, and always have that yearly option. There's no uh, enrollment period or anything like that. But so if you want to start supporting and take advantage of that bonus content and uh, merch, depending on the level that you sign up at, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash working cows. Or uh, if you have supported in the past, I just wanted to give you a heads up that those renewals might be coming because uh, I know there was quite a number of you that signed up last year right around this time. So thanks so much for the support. Appreciate it. And uh, hope to be releasing uh, bonus content. I've been uh, trying to be more intentional about recording bonus content with uh, almost every guest and uh, got a few of those in the log now and got through a busy season uh, and hoping to kick out a few of those here in the next few weeks and continue to be consistent with that going forward. So Thanks for the support and look forward to continuing to uh, grow this, grow these, this content library. So thank you. Very excited to be joined next week by good friends of mine, Bart and Shannon Carmichael. Uh, they've been on a journey, a transition over the last several years and just on a, on a transition to find a better female that works in their environment and, and finding uh, those genetics that are adapted to their environment and then serving a customer with those genetics. So uh, looking forward to talking to Bart and Shannon Carmichael coming up next week on the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week. <laughs>